Uh, one of our graduate students, Jacob, uh, came to see me the other day because uh, I talked to you about those uh, sarcophagi that had Philistines buried in them in Gaza. And he showed me that in more recent thinking, they're Egyptian, not Philistine. And I, I looked at that, and he's right. And uh, more interesting was one we looked at that was just discovered. It was last April, I think, uh, in farther north in Israel, in the Jezreel Valley that's up in the northern half of Israel. Uh, a sarcophagus was excavated, discovered by mistake initially, initially which often happens. And it looks remarkably similar to me to the ones from Gaza. And uh, not only does it have that Egyptian look, but next to it, they found a gold Egyptian scarab signet ring. And uh, it's inscribed with the name of a pharaoh at the time, which is Seti. Seti the first was the father of Ramses II, you know, Yul Brynner, Ray Fiennes, that, that pharaoh. And uh, I don't know, is it just your idea, Jacob, or is it? Are they claiming out there that are they noting the connection to Joseph? I just, I mean, that's just you. Yeah. Good for you. Sure. There's other people. See, we have some very good students here. That you remember in the story of Joseph, the Pharaoh gives his ring to Joseph. Now Joseph shouldn't be buried in that spot, according to the biblical report. But you got to admit it's tempting when you come that close. And I put that together with a couple of other uh, experiences of our own students and, and uh, of my own. Uh, in uh, 1978 or 9 in the summer, I was uh, staying in Jerusalem at uh, St. Andrew's Hospice, which was my favorite place to stay in those days. I looked out my window one morning there, and I saw a bunch of people digging up the grounds downstairs. So I go downstairs, and it's a, a team of archaeologists from the University of Tel Aviv. And you know, I, I'm in the business, so to speak. So I, I chatted them up, and uh, they had uh, excavated some Iron Age tombs, Jewish tombs from the biblical period there. And uh, they were digging. It was really interesting. I didn't think much of it. But I didn't know that at the time, in one of the tombs, they found uh, this uh, thing. It was um, an inscription. It was apparently around the neck of one of the uh, buried people. Uh, they would uh, hammer silver real flat, so flat that it would be like uh, tin foil now. And they'd, with a stylus, write words, in, carved them into the, the foil. Then they'd roll it up, put a string through it, and you could wear it around your neck like an amulet. So he found this thing, and they, they start to unroll it, and it keeps cracking. I mean, it was 3,000-year-old silver, or 2,500-year at least uh, silver. And uh, so it became like the archaeological equivalent of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. You know, if you, if you, if you look, you can't see it, because any time you tried to open it, it would break. So they gave up, and they put it in the Israel Museum. But one curator in the museum, Ada Yardani, just would not give up. And she invented this concoction of acrylic and glue and gunk and beech nut gum. I, I don't know what she put in that thing. And, and, and she puts it all around the outside and then opens it a, one gazillionth of an inch. That's the technical terms that we scholars use. It was a, a milli gazillionth. Uh, uh, and, and then she puts on more gunk and then she opens it. And it took her like a year. And she opens up the whole thing, and then she reads what it says in Hebrew, which was, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord give you peace. It's, it's the priestly blessing from Numbers chapter 6 that we just read for last class. So it's the oldest piece of Bible ever found. So if they ever ask you what's the oldest, that, you know, Alex for 2,000, you know, they, 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 can you get 2,000 on any in, in that show? Uh, they, uh, what's the oldest piece of Bible I found? It's the priestly benediction that was found in these tombs in uh, uh, Jerusalem. Now, that's very cool. Um, and when you get these things like this, every now and then there are these moments, and they don't usually happen. It's not usually like in movies where you just, you know, you discover the ark. 
it's, it's uh, usually you excavate a whole site and you learn about a whole life and a community, but every now and then you find one of these really uh, cool pieces. Uh, I mentioned last time, you know, finding Balaam written on a text, and uh, that's nice, you know. So uh, when I told you at the beginning of the course that, that there's been two revolutions, and one of them is the archaeological revolution, you should get a sense of that. We're really redoing everything. Uh, and more and more I've been lecturing under the, the, the title, Everything You Know Is Wrong. And I finally decided to stop offending my audiences with that title. So now I made it Everything We Know Is Wrong. See, that sounds more, <laughs> you know. A couple more things about some law items that we didn't get to. Uh, in Leviticus 18, I left out all the sex laws. You, you don't want me to leave the sex out of the course. It tells you all the people with whom you can sleep and with whom you can't sleep. Uh, it's interesting because people often notice that, that one of them is that um, you, uh, you can't sleep with your sister, including a half-sister, because remember they had <coughs> harems in those days. So you, a man and uh, a woman, if they had the same father, or if they had the same mother, either way, either one parent in common, that's a, a forbidden relationship. But then you remember that story about Abraham saying that his wife Sarah was his sister. And in one of the three versions of that story, he says, um, well, in fact, she was my sister because she's the daughter of my father but not of my mother. And you're going, uh, Abraham, that's one of our little no-nos. And you go, well, no, that law hadn't been given yet. So, okay, but uh, it's, it's striking, you know. I dated a first cousin once in my past, long ago, and don't look at me like that. I'm, I checked, and in some states in the United States, that's legal, and in other states, that's illegal. Biblically, it's, permiss it's permitted. First cousins is okay. Now, I don't know if all of you are starting to think about all your first cousins, and, you know, but, but don't, you know, don't, don't, don't go there. It's, it, it's, uh, I looked up the biological statistics on consanguinity, and it, you're 10 times more likely to have any given birth defect with a first cousin than not. Uh, but it's permitted biblically, and, uh, and given that the odds just in two random people is like one in like a million, so with a cousin, it, that would make it like one in 100,000. And you say, well, that's, that's not so bad, but it's your kids, you know. So I've, to I've said everything I'm going to say. That's all. <laughs> I, um, the, uh, the most, uh, one of the best known laws of Leviticus 18 in the sexual laws is the one against uh, homosexuality, and that's become a big issue nowadays because homosexuality is correctly an issue. Uh, you should note a couple of things about it. It's, it's written twice near the end of Leviticus 18 in, in two different forms. And uh, it says that uh, a man uh, shouldn't lie with another man literally the layings of a woman, which is usually translated something like the way he would lie with a woman. And uh, it, it pretty likely, right, does mean male-male uh, sex is forbidden. What's interesting is female homosexuality is never forbidden in the Hebrew Bible, only male. And uh, Bible scholars being what they are, they always come up with these theories about why that would be, that male is forbidden and female, female is not forbidden. And they usually say it's something to do with that what they valued was the seed. They thought that the seed produces the baby and that therefore uh, uh, it's only uh, male homosexuality where they say would waste the seed, like in that story where the guy, remember in, in the story of Judah and Tamar where his son withdraws during sex and, and spills a seed on the ground. And, and so some people from that make it, therefore you shouldn't masturbate, which is not true. You're all okay, don't worry. And, 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 uh, and the, uh, look, we're on sex today, I'm sorry. I, I didn't write, I didn't, oh. I didn't write this book. So, I don't know if dropping that book meant anything just now, but. Um, Hi, I just dropped in. So um, <laughs> the, uh, 
That thing about the seed does not really make very much sense. Uh, they, they, people, cause, because those who say that claim that the woman's body was seen as just a receptacle, that would, you know, like the oven, that all, all, all the ingredients of the cake came from the man. Now, um, that is very unlikely to be correct, and I don't see any evidence for it. Uh, I mean, people just had to look around, and every now and then you noticed that people resembled both of their parents. You know, you, you, they, they must have known that you got something from your mother, biologically, as well as your father, without having to take a big course on DNA and genetics. So uh, that thing about the seed, uh, I think, is an unlikely uh, explanation. I think uh, the, uh, the more probable reason uh, why female homosexuality isn't forbidden in the Bible is a very practical one. Uh, these laws are written by guys. This was a world that had polygamy. We've spoken of that, and polygamy affected a lot of things. A man could have many wives and concubines and girlfriends. We've spoken of that, and that was permissible in the law, biblically. Now, one of the great male fantasies is female homosexuality. In any issue of <coughs> men's magazines of the Playboy and more radical than Playboy ilk, on any website, in movies more and more, there are scenes involving women together. And these are mostly in movies that are made and magazines that are for the entertainment of men. It is a male fantasy either to watch or to be with more than one woman. Now in our generation it's a fantasy and for some groups of men and women it comes true and for others it doesn't. Um, but it's, it's out there. It's no longer as hidden as a fantasy as it was like just 20 years ago. That on, uh, in the course of the 10, episode, 10 seasons of Friends, pretty much everybody, all the women kissed all the other women at one time or another, or kissed some other guest, Winona Ryder and Jennifer Aniston, I think, and, and I, I can't keep track of all the ones there were. It, in, in movies, uh, I mean, it, it's not like just, uh, you know, movies that would only be shown in a little triple X rated theater. I mean, you know, in, in Black Swan, you, you, you could get an Oscar for Best Actress uh, if you're Natalie Portman together with Mila Kunis. Uh, uh, and, and, and more, I mean, you could start thinking back, you know, listing all, all the cases now. Uh, that it's, it's a, a visible thing. Uh, and in that world, in the biblical world, if a man could afford it, if he could have a harem, uh, he could have that fantasy every night. And the last thing on earth guys were going to do was make a law forbidding this thing that they could have. And to me, that makes much more sense as an explanation of why they didn't forbid female homosexuality, but did forbid male homosexuality. They were still male homophobic. They didn't want another guy in their bed with them. But they sure wanted two women in the bed with them. Now, you can buy that or not. I cannot prove that that is the reason for that. But at least uh, it's a striking thing. Now, what are we going to do about the male homosexuality? Uh, I do not think it is deniable uh, that the text does explicitly forbid it. Some people say it refers only to anal intercourse uh, and, and other acts are not forbidden, but I don't see that at, uh, at all. Uh, it, it says you don't lie with a man the way you lie with a woman, which sounds to me like any of those stuff you could do with a woman, you, you're not supposed to do with a man. Um, others interpret that differently. but. Um, I did publish a piece about this where I was trying to see, is there any way, since I know people who are homosexual but are also religious Jews or Christians, and they, they, they're sensitive to this. It's, it's a real issue in their lives. And I wanted to see, is there any way within the text 
without cheating. Uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, and trying to give an honest interpretation of the text that, that there could be some way that it might be uh, still approved within the, that law. And I think there is. The, the law in both cases where it occurs, in Leviticus 18, says that the reason you don't do this is because it's a to eva. Or I'm even there saying it wrong. It doesn't say that that's the reason you don't do it. It says you're forbidden to do it, and it says it is a to eva. Now, in the King James English translation, this word was translated an abomination. And most English translations have followed that until recently. Uh, abomination is a very, very strong word. And the question is, is to eva that does it really mean that? Because toeva, abomination implies something that's just awful in itself. And uh, so my question is, is the word toeva an absolute term or a relative term? Is it a term, toeva, a toeva is a toeva, and that's it? It's bad, it's an abomination, end of discussion. Or is toeva a relative term, meaning something that is, is a toeva to you isn't a toeva to me? Or a toeva that is something that people in France would consider a toeva is, is not what people in the US or the Middle East would consider a toeva. That is to say, is it something that is relative to different people and different cultures and different periods? So for example, one of the things that would be a toeva would be this sleeping with your half-sister thing, but, but clearly in the period of Abraham, Abraham and Sarah don't consider it a toeva. And the author of the Bible telling that story does not consider it a toeva when they do it, but the author of the law in Leviticus does consider it a toeva. And in fact, the beginning of the term toeva is, is uh, in the, uh, the book of Genesis, where um, uh, Joseph's brothers come to Egypt. And uh, you remember the story? Joseph tells his brothers he's going to take some of them to meet the Pharaoh. And he says, when the Pharaoh says to you, what do you do for a living? Don't say you're shepherds. He says, because every shepherd is a toeva to the Egyptians. He says, tell them you're cowboys, not cow herds. Now, in, when I wrote her at the Bible, I used the word cowboy in it. I said the prophet Amos was a cowboy, because it says that in the book of Amos that. And I did receive criticism from that, because people told me that a cowboy is someone who herds candle, ca cattle on horseback. If you don't have a horse, you are not a cowboy. <laughs> I didn't know that. And there's no suggestion that the biblical prophets herded cattle on horseback. So I'm not changing it. I like my book. But you can all, if you want, cross out cowboy and write cow herd, you know, under there. So uh, he says to the brothers, tell them your cow herds. Do not tell them your shepherds, because every shepherd is a, a toeva to the Egyptians. But they're not a toeva to the Israelites or the Babylonians or the Phoenicians. They're all fine with, with being a shepherd. So it's, it's a relative term there. Or when uh, Moses is uh, bargaining back and forth with the Pharaoh about the departure of the Israelites, and uh, he says, well, we have to go out into the wilderness and hold a sacrifice to our, our God. And Pharaoh says, well, hold your sacrifice here in the land. You don't have to leave the country for that. And uh, Moses says, no, because the things that we would sacrifice would be a toeva to the Egyptians. But obviously, they're not a toeva to the Israelites. Now, if that's so, the toeva then is a relative term, that it can mean something different in one period from an, to another, or from one culture uh, to another then it seems to me the law that says homosexuality is forbidden, it's a toeva, would change if you are in a culture where it's not regarded as a toeva. Now, for much of history and great many countries, it was regarded that way. Uh, in the United States now, we're in, we're in a period of flux where people have different views about that. And, uh, and so, uh, if you live in a, in my reading of the text, if you live in a society where people no longer regard it as, as, as something, you know, bad in itself, uh, then uh, it's permissible. So it's the best I can do to see a path where uh, males 
would uh, would be okay. And I believe it. I don't. I'm not. That's. I don't feel like I'm. I'm twisting the biblical text to get there. I was accused of that in print of just I'm twisting to get there. And I said I don't do the twist. I. Uh, I did in the '60s. I did the twist, but but um, I'm not going to do that in front of you now. So just get that out of your head. One other law I want to mention also is uh, it it forbids human sacrifice. And they make a very very big deal of human sacrifice, and it says you know those awful Canaanites who lived in the land all this time they uh, committed human sacrifice. Now there's no evidence of that at all. We have no evidence of human sacrifice by anybody in the ancient Near East except the Phoenicians, in particular at their colony at Carthage. Now Carthage, you know, is on the north coast of Africa, so that's still nowhere in the Middle East, but the Phoenicians came from the Middle East. Phoenicians were uh, what is today uh, Lebanon. Uh, that's the, the only case where there's real evidence. By, by evidence, I mean there's a temple, and next to the temple there's a cemetery, and there's a lot of skeletons of babies and little children in that cemetery. And that really looks like evidence that they, they really did do uh, human sacrifice there. And I had a talk with uh, the, the great uh, anthropologist Mary Douglas, a blessed memory, and, and I, I was talking, and she, and, and she said, uh, oh no, there, there was no human sacrifice anywhere in the ancient world. And I said, well, yeah, except you know, at Carthage, of course. And she said, no, not, not there either. And, and I said, yeah, but you know, there's the cemetery with all the, the skeletons like, like right next to a temple. And now, Mary Douglas was British, and the British can only see things through the eyes of the British. And, and she, said, she said, well, you know, in England, every church has a cemetery next to it. Oh, so, okay. <laughs> So I wrote to uh, my friend uh, Joanne Hackett, who's a professor of Bible at, at the University of Texas and, uh, and, and has worked on Carthage. And I said, Mary Douglas says that, you know, in, in England, every church has a cemetery next to it. I didn't say it with the accent. And, and, and uh, Joanne said, yes, but some of these graves have inscriptions over them, so, you know, like, oh, Baal, accept my votive offering. I mean, I mean there's no question. <laughs> it, it, so that, that one is without a, uh, out exception, I'd say, uh, 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 human sacrifice. But for the rest of the Near East, there's no human sacrifice of any evidence, except in Israel itself, because the Bible says there were periods where, where uh, the, the Israelites committed uh, human sacrifice. A couple of the kings of, of, of Judea are accused of, of sacrificing their children. And it tells you right where they did it. And as it happens, it's right behind St. Andrew's Hospice. Right? I mean, I could look out from my window and see uh, the, the valley of, of, of Ben Chinom, very close to the place where they found that inscription that I was telling you about earlier, a little farther down the hill from there. So um, human sacrifice did exist. And uh, uh, the thing to note about it, though, it says you shouldn't put your child through the fire for a molek or as a molek or to a molek but people have understood this to be with a capital M uh, the name molek and it's the name of a god and you'll you can just you could look this up and like just google the word molek you find a hundred sites that tell you molek was the name of an ancient Canaanite god to whom they offered human sacrifices There's no such god as molek and uh, the most likely understanding of that actually uh, was a Harvard dissertation done in the early 1970s that was that Molech isn't the name of the god. Molech is the word for the institution of human sacrifice. So it's not saying don't pass your child to the, through the fire to Molech. It means don't pass your child through the fire as a Molech, you know, as a, as a human sacrifice practice. We will return to the question of uh, human sacrifice in ancient Israel a little later when we'll, we'll read various people protesting against it. But it seems like the accusation in the Bible that the Canaanites did human sacrifice, uh, like the, the, the thing of them doing um, temple prostitution, uh, may both be, especially the sacrifice, be more in our modern minds than, than in the text or in the, the archaeology of it. Any question about that? Okay. As Willy Wonka would say, okay. 
We'll move on to Deuteronomy, the last of the five books that open the Bible. The book of Deuteronomy in Hebrew is called uh, the book of, of uh, Devarim, which is the opening sentence of the book. It says that these are the Devarim. The Devarim, it's pronounced like a V, even though it's a B. Those of you who know Hebrew will understand why. The rest of you just trust me. It's the Hebrew, words for, the Hebrew word for words. So it says, these are the words that Moses spoke. And if you look, the book of Deuteronomy is presented as the last farewell speech of Moses. The first 30 of its 34 chapters are a speech by Moses. Now, that's pretty long. I, I, I timed it. I tried to say, if I were just reading this aloud, how long would it take? to give this as a speech, and I came up with about three hours. And you're supposed to go, well, maybe he had a speech defect, so maybe we should double that, you know. Uh, but in any event, it's, it's a long time, and you know, and, and he's 120 years old, it says, at the time, so he probably, you know, goes a little slower than I do. Um, my view is, you know, after, he, he's just given the last 40 years of his life to these people. If he wants to talk, he should get to talk for as long as he wants. But any of you have ever been to church or synagogue and heard the clergy person give a, a sermon and think of, you know, the longest one you ever heard where you're just dying, you know? Well now, I'll bet it wasn't three hours, so you, you could multiply it by that. There are some cultures where long speeches are admired. Um, uh, in, in Cuba, you know, Fidel Castro um, was, was famous uh, and he still, you know, was conscious uh, for giving um, the, the six-hour speeches in the public square in Havana. And I talked to a woman, I guess she was kind of Marxist, she was there, she's American, but she was there and sitting in the street, cross-legged in the sun for six hours, listening to pre the, the, the president giving his speech. And I said, you sat there for six hours listening to the speech? She said, I could have sat for six more. I go, oh, okay, all right. I'm I've never loved any politician on any party to, to enough to listen to, to, to that. But, uh, but Moses, okay, fair enough. And to me, the book of Deuteronomy is crucial in a lot of ways, and one is that it really puts together everything that's been happening in the first four books. They really culminate there. Parts of it he reviews his history with the people. A part of it he gives some new laws. Part he reviews some old laws. And at the end, we'll come to the part, especially in chapters 29 and, and 30, where it is simply beautiful. I think chapters 29 and 30 are probably the two most beautiful chapters of prose uh, in the Hebrew Bible. And, um, and that's really interesting because now, in my mind, I'm bouncing back to the burning bush where you first see M Moses meeting God for the first time. And remember the first way he tries to get out of going to Egypt, as he says to God about the heavy tongue, heavy mouth thing. But the way he words it there, the first is he says, I'm not a man of words, he says to God. I'm not a man of devarim. And now you come to the last book of the Bible, and he's become a man of words. And the whole book is words. And he's, be, and he's changed. And when I told you about this you know, character development that grows in the Bible, this is the ultimate of it. The, the guy who said, I'm not a man of words, now gives this stunning speech. And you should read it with the sense of that. In, in the first 11 chapters, he talks about his past with the people. And uh, he's very harsh at one point. If you read chapter 9, he, said, he says absolutely the opposite of the, where, where people think that the Bible sort of like favors the Jews and says they're the, the special people, the treasured people, the chosen people. And all. But Moses there says, don't think that it's because of your merit that God is bringing you into the land. Because it's not. You've been bad since the day I met you. And then he, starts, he says, remember that golden calf thing? Remember this thing? Remember this? And, and he goes, like reviews a lot of the, the, the revolts. And he says, it's not that you're special. It is that God made a covenant with your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And if you keep that covenant, yet yeah, then you will be like a holy people. If you violate that covenant, then you know, you're in a jam. 
And, and uh, it's, it's, it's much more nuanced than people make it. The chosen people, holy people, nation of priests thing is always nuanced in covenant uh, terminology. It never comes up, ever, without being in the context of covenant. If you keep the covenant, yeah, then, then you, that's good, then you're good. If you break the covenant, then, then you're bad. And uh, uh, so that, that's a remarkable thing. And then he goes from chapters 12 to 26 with this uh, set of laws. So it's a second law. And the way you say second law in Greek is deuteronomos, second law. So that's why the book in English is named after the Greek Deuteronomy, because our English names of the books are mostly based on the content of each book, Genesis, Exodus. But, um, but the uh, Hebrew names of the books are just based on the opening words of each book. And, and in this case, I, I like the Hebrew better, but you know, words, I think that's great. And, uh, but the idea of a second law is important. So you read chapters 12 to 26, and all these laws I've been mentioning to you, now we'll have to look at a bunch more. Um, and then finally, uh, in, in uh, chapter 28, he gets into blessings and curses. And you remember, that was part of the uh, treaty documents that I mentioned earlier. This, you also find some of them, some of them even the same curses if you break the covenant, and the same as blessings uh, if you keep it. Uh, interestingly, the number of curses is four times the length of the number of blessings. So apparently, you know, the stick still works better than the carrot when you're trying to get people to, to do stuff. And the, the curses, they get pretty bad. Like, you know, mothers will eat their children. That, I always thought that's a rather bad one. And uh, you'll find that actually comes true <coughs> later on in, in the Book of Kings. We'll see that happen. And, uh, and what's particularly interesting to me is uh, the last curse. If you look, it's Deuteronomy 28. It's 68 verses long. So it's the longest chapter in the five books of Moses. And uh, with all these, mostly because of these curses. And, and uh, it builds to the last one. And you go, oh, what, what would be the last curse? Like, what's the worst thing you can say to Israel? And the last curse is, and you will return to Egypt by the way that I told you you'd never see it again. And you'll sell yourselves there as slaves, and no one will buy you. Ooh. It's like the ultimate, meaning you'll just go, the worst that can happen to you is you'll end up back where you started, even worse off than you were before. Now, don't forget that last curse because it's going to come true, too. They don't all come true, but, but, but that one very strikingly uh, does. And then come these chapters 29 and 30 that, that are remarkably worded, where Moses is now not criticizing the people the way he was at the beginning. He's saying, you know, your God loves you. you. You made a covenant with your ancestors. And he says, summarizing all these laws, he says, this commandment that I give you, he said, it's not up in the heavens that you'd say, well, who will go up in the sky and bring it back to us and we'll do it? And it's not across the sea that you'd say, well, who will go across the sea and bring it back to us and then we'll do it? He says, but it's very close to you, in your mouth and in your heart, to do it. And I go, wow, this is a guy who said I'm not a man of words? It's fabulous. And uh, so it, it's a, a tremendous culmination to uh, you know, the life of, of Moses. Now let's look at the book a bit overall and a bit in terms of specifics. At the opening, it says uh, that they're there in this, uh, this point in the land that's right across from where they've been going, right? So Mediterranean, Nile, Red Sea, Dead Sea, I mean, yeah, Sea of Galilee, Jordan River. They are now located here in the plains of Moab, right? Which is what is today the central part of Jordan. And uh, so he's here where they could almost look across the river and see it. And uh, it refers to this location, and it says, it is 11 days from Horeb. Now, wherever you think Mount Sinai is, if you think it's down here or here or here or in the middle, it's 11 days journey, it says, from there. Why does it mention the distance from this one location to Hoab. 
And then it begins telling the account of what Moses is saying. And it says, and it was in the 40th year. You're supposed to put the two halves of that sentence together. It's telling you they could have done it in 11 days. And it took them 40 years because of what they did. Also notice where they are. They're just at the edge of the Jordan River, which is the natural boundary to cross over into, into their, what will be their new land or their return to their old land. And you should note at least that Moses' life begins and ends at a river. Uh, he starts out as this baby in the basket floating up a river. And now his life ends just at the river that is the boundary to where his life's dream is to go, but he's never going to go. And it's a, a famous thing, uh, really, uh, uh, how much water figures in the life of Moses. I mean, we know fire figures in his life as the burning bush and the, the, the hail that turns to fire and the, the fire that swallows a few people out and, uh, you know, a column of fire and fire on the mountain. But there's also, you know, water that um, the, uh, the first plague uh, on Egypt is that the water turns to blood. And at the end of the story, the, the Red Sea uh, splits for them. And then there's the story where they, they come to a rock at Meribah, and he hits it, and the water comes out. And then there's the story where there's bitter water, and he puts his stick in it, and it becomes drinkable. And then when he destroys the golden calf, the description is that he grinds the golden calf thin as dust, it says, throws it on the wadi, the, filled with water, and he makes the people drink it. And then there's the culmination of the story, which is at the second Meribah, the big event of Moses' life where he fails. And he says to the people, shall we bring water for you, for you from this rock? And he hits the rock when he was supposed to speak to it. And that's his ultimate sin. And uh, I spoke at the time about how you know, Aaron gets drawn into that sin, too, because he hits it with a stick with Aaron's name on it and the magical, miraculous stick. But there's also a question people have always argued about what the sin of Moses is. Is it simply that he disobeyed God, he hit the rock when he's supposed to talk to the rock? Is it that he said to the people, listen, rebels, shall we bring you water from this rock? When, who is he to call the people rebels and insult them when he's been like the person in whom they've trusted all this time? Or is it because he said, shall we bring you water from this rock? When he should have said, shall God bring you water from this rock? And when God says to him, you and Aaron will not live to go into the land and all, he says, it's because you didn't sanctify me. Which sounds like it's a little bit of all of the above. That uh, first of all, saying, shall we bring, when he should have said, shall God bring. But that's a little tricky, because if you look, when God gave him the commandment, God says to him, and you bring water from the rock. So again, it kind of looks like, and God did tell him to take the stick. So the, God is at least in the picture, you know, part of, you know, uh, accessory after the fact, you know, before the fact. And, and, uh, and also the fact that not just only does he say, shall we do it, but hitting the rock is different from talking to the rock. It's not only that he did it wrong and the miracle still worked, which is interesting, but also talking to the rock, there's no contact between you and the rock. It doesn't look like you're doing it. But if he hits the rock with a stick, it looks more like he's doing it. So both by his actions and his words, he's taking credit uh, for the first time. Because remember, every time until this, when the people said to him, you know, you, you brought us out of Egypt, and all, he keeps saying, no, it's not me, it's God. It's not me, it's God. And just one time, he goes, OK, it's me. <laughs> and that's how many chances you get. And he's out. You know, it's like it's like an ISIL. You can say anything you want once. It's you only get you only get one chance. And in that sense, Moses, I think, is very much like the the, the Greek or Shakespearean notion of the tragic hero. I don't mean the tragic hero the way they teach it to you in high school. That is, he has a tragic flaw. There's something inside him, and that's why. He, I mean, the tragic hero in the sense that the tragic hero 
as interpreted by Nietzsche, was it's somebody who's up against something where he cannot win. In, in, in tragic drama, nobody who watches all of Hamlet is surprised by the ending. Nobody at the end of Oedipus sits there the whole time going, Gee, oh, I hope he works this out. Maybe, maybe it'll turn out <laughs> she wasn't his mother after all, you know? And, and, uh, and nobody thinks that, that at the end of Hamlet, just before he and Laertes kill each other with the swords or something, you know, uh, the Forts and Bras <coughs> army marches in and brings freedom and peace to Denmark and he gets to be the king and he tells his mother and she, she, she says, I'm sorry, I married your uncle who killed my husband and, and, and everybody's happy. Happy and I mean, that's, that doesn't happen, and, and the point is you don't anticipate it uh, happening. On the contrary, you usually get hints in a, uh, a tragic play of, of what's coming. Where, where, I, mean, I mean, Lady Macbeth, see, it's always, the wife always sees it before the husband. Lady Macbeth sees where this whole thing is going long before Macbeth does. And uh, Oedipus's mother wife, uh, Iocasta, uh, also says to him, so what have you done that all men haven't done in dreams, you know? And, and, uh, and, and there's always this, this element of it. It's that the tragic hero has to fall. A play or a movie or a book or a story where uh, the hero falls at the end by, you know, death or, or exile isn't necessarily tragic. It's the, the alternative to tragedy. It's pathetic. It's it, pathos. It's uh, that the... the he falls, you know, he fell because things went wrong or whatever. In tragedy, the hero falls because he necessarily must fall. It's been loaded that way all along. And when it happens, it's upsetting but not surprising. And in the case of Moses, all along, he, he didn't want to go on the trip to Egypt. He tried five ways to get out of it. When he got there, he kept saying, it's not me, it's God. He's going through all this. The people are upsetting him for 40 years. And one day, he finally blows it, and he, and he does what he wasn't supposed to do, and he commits the ultimate. It's a ritual sin. It's an ethical sin. It's a direct disobedience of God, it, and it's putting himself in the place of God, and it all comes together, and that's it, and he pays the heaviest price which is he is exiled from the land that, that was his dream. And uh, to me, that, you know, that's very close to what we mean by tragedy. I wouldn't therefore say the Bible is a tragedy. When, when people try to apply tragedy to the Bible, sometimes they pick out King Saul, sometimes they pick Moses as the, the quintessential biblical tragic hero. But there's not a reason why you have to play that game where you learn something in one subject and you just twist it and turn it to make it come out and apply to another subject. Greek tragedy was Greek tragedy. Shakespearean tragedy is Shakespearean tragedy. The Bible is not a tragedy. But there is this tragic aspect uh, to Moses which does fit the kind of thing that we see in the great you know, tragic histories of uh, tragic dramas of uh, the Greeks and the English. And why there's almost no, if any, great tragedy written by Americans. It's not our culture. We, we, we're a yes I can culture. We're not a I'm going to lose no matter what, but okay, the game is fixed, deal me in. Because that's the principle of tragedy. The game is fixed, God damn it, deal me in. Yeah. What about the Godfather? Oh, that's interesting. You mean Michael? Yes, I Michael Corleone. Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. That is really interesting. <laughs> you didn't change the subject. Michael has a lot of really interesting parallels to Moses. He, he, he didn't start, on, those of you who know these movies, we're all just going to stop for a moment here. Uh, he, he doesn't start out wanting it. He resists it. Kay, I'm only telling you this because that's my family. That's not me. I'm not going to do this. I'm never going into the family business. Well, very interesting. Yeah, he comes very close to being tragic. In, yeah, in the Greek sense. Yeah, we finally did it. Just when I was saying we Americans couldn't do it. Of course, it was an Italian-American who wrote it, so maybe it was his heritage that enabled him to do it. I don't know. Well, that's interesting. Well, good. 
<laughs> Proud to be an American. <laughs> so this water theme, finally the last thing we should note is if there's all these occurrences of water that not only keep occurring in Moses' life, but at significant places in his life. I mean, this is, this is the denouement. The, the, the turning point of his life is when he makes the water come from the rock, and his life begins and ends at water. So it, it, these aren't, none of these are small. The most famous thing of Moses' life is the splitting of the Red Sea. So the water thing, and then there's the fact that his name Moses was interpreted, remember when they gave it from the Pharaoh's daughter, to mean because I drew him from the water. So his very name implies it. So that's really interesting. And after all, then, you can, you, if you, you can carry this water business as far as you want to go. I mean, the, the, the opening of the Bible, remember, is there's nothing but water. And all of creation comes out of water. When God's wind hits the water, that's the beginning of everything. And uh, in the Garden of Eden story, remember, it said that the, there, there couldn't be humans created yet, and there, there couldn't be anything because uh, they weren't able to uh, work the, the, the soil because it hadn't been watered yet. And then these, uh, this uh, stream comes up, and four rivers then proceed out of the Garden of Eden, and they water the earth, and then humans can be created. So if you don't have water, you don't have humans. And there's, you know, the fact that you learn in in biochemistry that human, what percent of our bodies are water? 90 something, is that 80 percent of our bodies is, is water? There's probably some really good jokes in there somewhere, but I don't know. At the beginning of Deuteronomy, Moses gives the commandment twice. It's in Deuteronomy 4.2, and then at the beginning, the first verse of Deuteronomy 13, 4.2 and 13.1, so I'm giving you the numbers because it it is, to me, uh, the most violated commandment in the Bible. And if I'd say to you, uh, or, you, you know, you can test this, you know, go out and ask your friends after, you know, ask your family, what's the most violated commandment in the Bible? Ask a minister or a priest or a rabbi, you know, what's the most violated commandment in the Bible? No, and it's not the one you all just thought of. The most violated commandment in the Bible is there, which is you shall not add and you shall not take away from this commandment. And I would even say either half of it is the most violated commandment in the Bible because people add to it and take away from it all the time. And the classic case of it, you know, is right at the beginning in the Garden of Eden when the snake is trying to get uh, the woman to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and bad. She said, God said that we can't eat from it or even touch it or we'll die. God had never said you couldn't touch it. He just said you can't eat it. And even ancient commentators on the Bible noticed this, uh, that it was the principle that, it's that you start out adding to, to a, a law, you'll end up taken away from it. Because so, now the snake can just kind of like push up against the tree and go, see, you can touch it. Look. Oh, he didn't. Oh, yeah, he does have hands at the beginning. Yeah, you can touch it. So remember that. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, tremendous. and. Uh, has tremendous implications for later Judaism and Christianity who arguably add and or take away from uh, commandments of the Bible. In chapter 7, there's the point where he uses the, the term uh, chosen. He says, God chose you to become a treasured people. You'll be a holy people. But it's also there in, in, in uh, Deuteronomy 7 that he says, but it's not because of your size, you're very small people. It's not because of your merit, you've always been a stiff-necked, troublesome people. It's because of a covenant. And the covenant, therefore, you see, is a good thing, but it is a burden as well. In Deuteronomy 5, he repeats the Ten Commandments. If you look very carefully at the way the Ten Commandments were stated at Sinai in Exodus 20, and the way they're stated in Deuteronomy 5, there are slight differences, which is really interesting. In Exodus 20, it says, the reason you're supposed to keep the Sabbath is because God created the universe in six days, and on the seventh day he rested, so the seventh day is the Sabbath. Very nice. In Deuteronomy 5, when Moses says, you remember when God gave us the Ten Commandments, and they were, and then he repeats them all, and he comes to the Sabbath, and he says, Remember to keep the Sabbath day because you were slaves in Egypt and God brought you out. And you go, wait a minute, which is it? And you could say, well, it's both. Or you could say, Moses remembers wrong. Or you could say, Moses wants to, he's not going to change the, the, the law itself, 
but he's giving you a second reason. I mean, you, you can you know, interpret away, uh, but the fact is there is this very striking difference for the reason for keeping the, uh, the Sabbath day between the two. And interestingly, in uh, 1947, this goat makes the greatest archaeological discovery of the 20th century, the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's at a place called Qumran, which is right near the Dead Sea, near the top of the Dead Sea. It's called Qumran. So you'll see people call them the Qumran Scrolls or the Dead Sea Scrolls. And um, where was I? Goat. Dead Sea Scrolls. In the, oh, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. I was testing you. <laughs> I knew what I was doing all along. I'm not getting old and uh, forgetful. Um, they say that the first two signs of senility are one, you start losing your memory, and two, um, <laughs> so, uh, in the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, there's one that's called the All Souls Deuteronomy Scroll. It's one of them that was found, and it's a text of Deuteronomy 5, and it's got this line about the Sabbath in it. And it says, you shall keep the Sabbath day, you won't work, your servant, your, your animal your, uh, won't work on, on the seventh day. Because God created the heavens and the earth in six days, and on the seventh day he rested. And because you were slaves in Egypt, and God brought you out with a strong arm and a mighty hand and all that. It, it, it collapses both the Exodus version and the De Deuteronomy version, has them both on the, on the same little piece of, of uh, parchment. And I don't know what we should do with that, what that would mean, but some scribe made a decision. Uh, to include both texts. So then there are these other laws from chapters 12 to 26. The very first one is the law of centralization. Now remember we had the law of centralization in Leviticus. So that's why we speak of a second law. It's giving you know, a law that you know already, but it gives it in different words. In Leviticus it says if you want to sacrifice an animal in order you know, to be able to eat lamb chops, you've got to take your lamb to the entrance of the tent of meeting. So it's always at this one central place. And I've talked about that, that the, the successor of that central place, the tabernacle, is the temple, and that I think it's consistent with monotheism, one place we sacrifice, all of that. And um, in Deuteronomy, interestingly, though, it says, what if you live too far away from the central place? I mean, what if you live, in those days, it was Carmel. Today, that place, Mount Carmel, is in the middle of uh, Haifa. If you look at a map of Israel, that's that's way up here in the north. The temple was in Jerusalem, which was right about there, about halfway up the middle. That's a very long walk for a lamb chop, you know? And, uh, and so it says, what do you do if you live too far away? Now in Leviticus, as far as I can tell, the answer to that question is tough. And it didn't matter that much anyway, because remember, they didn't have refrigeration. When you wanted lamb chops, you didn't kill your lamb and have lamb chops that night there's still two sides of lamb left, at, let alone a cow. You know, to get one steak, you don't kill a whole cow. So, and you couldn't keep it for a long time. So we'll come to the holidays. There were three main holidays every year. And on these three holidays, you were required to make a pilgrimage to the central place, which meant everybody in Israel was supposed to go to the temple three times a year, and the holidays were big feasts. One of them is Passover, and we'll speak of the other two as well. And you, and you go and you, you have this tremendous feast because you kill the cow and the whole clan eats it. And the rest, you know, you make you know, beef jerky and do the best you can for the rest of the year. Uh, also, you can hunt. Game is permitted in, in the Bible, and, and you don't have to like catch a deer and lead it up to an altar and sacrifice it like a cow. You're allowed to hunt. Uh, uh, wild animals, and uh, but there's a ceremony where you uh, you pour the blood off into the ground. Some of the blood of the animal 
symbolically, whatever you think that means, that you've taken, recognize you've taken the life of that animal. In Deuteronomy, it gives you a dispensation that Leviticus didn't give. It said, if you live too far from the central place, then it's okay, you can, you can kill your lamb or your cow or whatever at home, not in a proper sacrifice at the central place. Only, it says, you have to do the ceremony of pouring some of the blood off the same as you would have done if it were a deer or, or you know, some wild animal that you killed. That's not a small point, that little dispensation. Because the last temple in Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans in the year 70 CE. And as many of you know, this is 2014 CE, which is much later than in the era of time than 70 CE. So if there had only been the Leviticus law, that you can only eat animals that are sacrificed at the central altar, then Jews would have had to have been vegetarian for the last 2,000 years, except for a hunting game. But no cows, no chickens, no lamb chops, no doves, no not allowed. And, uh, and so because of this dispensation in Deuteronomy where, yeah, okay, if you live too far, all right, you don't have to go all the way, okay. Uh, that's what made it possible that today, you, uh, you know, Jews can have meat and you can kill it in Athens. Um, but that centralization law is, is a, a, a tremendous thing. And notice the difference in the wording. In uh, Leviticus, it was, you sacrifice it at the entrance of the tent of meeting. It's always about the tabernacle there. Whereas in Deuteronomy, it says, you do sacrifice in the place where Yahweh, it's usually translated, causes his name to dwell. It's a verb that means, uh, it's the verbal form of the word tent. So it would be the place where God tents his name. And his name is always associated with the ark. So, the assumption is that Deuteronomy means the same thing that Leviticus means. But in Leviticus, it's always called doing at the entrance of the tent of meeting. In Deuteronomy, it's the place where God tents his name. But understand they both mean the same thing, that you're not supposed to sacrifice in New York. It can, or anywhere else in Israel, even. Only at the, the one central place. And we'll see where that is when we come to that in the story. He repeats the list of, of forbidden animals. There's some differences, but it's pretty close, so I won't do all of that again. He repeats the holidays that you also had back in Leviticus. So in case you didn't get them then, here's a refresher uh, course. There are these three holidays where everybody in Israel is required to go to the central place and, and have this tremendous feast together. It's not as impossible as you might think. I mean, the whole of Israel is still you know, smaller than the whole of Georgia. It's not a tremendous zone. It is, it's, uh, yes, it's a burden if you live up here or, or down here by the Red Sea. Yeah, that's, it is a burden, but it, it's doable. And uh, you're required to go and bring some of your grain and some of your animals and, and all of that. And uh, the three holidays are, number one, Passover. Passover takes place on the first full moon of spring. So it's on, if you look in the Bible, the date it gives is the 15th of the month. And it's the first month of spring. So uh, this year, we're in the fall semester, but so you won't see me then. But if you, on the spring semester, if you look on a calendar, and when it says when Passover is, if you look out that night, I promise you there will be a full moon. Because it's always on the 15th of a lunar month, which would mean the night of the full moon. And uh, uh, after that, it says the next holiday, it says you count a week of weeks, seven times seven days, 49 days. And on the 50th day is the Feast of Weeks, which is the second major holiday. In Hebrew, it's called Shavuot, which means weeks. Passover is called Pesach, with a on the end, Pesach, which is understood to be the thing that, that God did when he sees the bloods on the doors in Egypt. He Pesach at the door, so it means to stop, to cease, and it's usually mistranslated into English as Passover, but you're not going to make everybody change all their holidays and all the calendars. So look, it's Passover, okay? Just leave it. Uh, so, so that's 50 days 
later. So it's not a full moon, but it's, it is, uh, you know, in, in the summer. And then in the fall, there is a holiday that is variously called the Feast of Tabernacles or the Feast of Booths, where they're trying to translate the Hebrew word Sukkot, one Sukkah, two Sukkot, it's a plural. And uh, for one week, you're supposed to live in a, um, a makeshift dwelling. You put up a hut. Um, I do it. I'll build it in a couple weeks, put one up in my backyard every year. And then I forget to take it down until around Passover. <laughs> it takes me a long time to get around. You're supposed to take it down when it's over. You know, it's, it's an eight-day holiday. Passover is seven days. Shavuot is one day. These were all changed. In, uh, outside of Israel, these holidays are usually all observed by an extra day by Jews. So Passover is seven, according to the Bible, but it's observed by not all Jews, uh, many Jews, Orthodox and conservative Jews in the US and in Europe for eight. Shavuot is supposed to be one, but outside of Israel it's observed for two. Tabernacles is supposed to be eight, plus, but the, counting an extra one that comes at the end, but we, we make it nine. Why Jews? I mean, it, it's, it's why everything is, 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 and it's interesting because it did say that the worst thing to do is to add to the commandments, so you could argue that they shouldn't do this. But it was done in a period where, remember, you, you couldn't know with the precision that we know now of calendars, so if all Jews wanted to be celebrating, say, Shavuot on the same day, but you're in different time zones and, and you know, you're far apart to travel and all, uh, it, it would take two days to get it straight and be sure that you're all overlapping with each other. So it was, apparently that was the reason why that was done, but only in the post-biblical period. But in Israel, they still do it the way it says in the Bible, and Reformed Jews all around the world still do it the way it says to do it in the Bible. But I mean, this isn't a course on later Judaism, it's a course on what the biblical rule is. So it's, it's the, these three occasions. And uh, Sukkot, which is going to come up a few weeks from now, I'll point out to you so you can go out that night. And I promise you there will be a full moon. It'll be the 15th of the uh, lunar month. Now, those are the three main holidays. The book of Leviticus adds two others. One of them, it says, on the first day of the seventh month. Right, so Passover comes in the first month, right? It's the 15th day of the first month. And Shavuot comes 49 days later, so whatever number month that comes out. The seventh month is here, Tabernacles, and it's on the 15th day. But it says on the first day of this month, you should have a solemn assembly, a major holiday. And it never tells you the name of that holiday. But it happens that later in Jewish history, Jews started counting not Passover anymore as the beginning of the year, but the fall as the beginning of the new year, the autumnal new year. It was probably when they started going to university and they realized that it all, no. Anyway, the, uh, that day, therefore today, is called the, Ju the, the new year in Judaism. So be aware that it is a biblical holiday, but the, Bib the Bible never treats it as new year. From the Bible's point of view, Passover is new year. Uh, but it, it's called New Year, which in Hebrew is Rosh Hashanah. I remember in the early days of Saturday Night Live, Lorraine Newman, she'd be standing in the middle of Times Square in the fall on the show. And she'd say, as a newswoman going, you know, I am standing in Times Square for Rosh Hashanah, the new year. As you can see, there is no one here. <laughs> the ball isn't coming down. <laughs> it was funny. Yeah. Um, I've heard it called Yom Teruah. What is that? Yes, it has some other names. Are those not biblical? Though? Is that? Uh, no, it does, it does say that you should have Teruah on, on Rosh Hashanah. It's the Hebrew word for uh, the blasting of a horn. And they do. They, you, you sound a, uh, a ram's horn. I have one. I could bring it in. I probably will not do that for you. Uh, it's called a shofar, and you, and you bl blow different sounds on it, yes, and I, I could do that. I do know how. And, uh, and I have a very big one. You know, my shofar is bigger than your shofar. And, um, and the big thing is at the end of the holiday, there's one long blast. And it used to be that just one person in synagogues would do it, but now there's a thing where a lot of guys 
have gotten them. So at the end, a lot of people bring it, and it's the end of the, the holiday, and so they all get to do one big long blast. It becomes like, who can you know, hold it the longest, and, do the, and, and you're a real man, you know, if you, you, guys are just, it's a guy thing. Mm -hmm. I'd really like to see a woman, you know, just win it, just to humiliate all the guys. You know, that'd be a great statement. Anyway, it says that's on the first day of the month, and on the tenth day of the month is a holiday that is named, and that's called the Day of Atonement. A day where you look back on the past year and judge your acts and, and be sorry, repent, for, atone for the things you've done wrong and start off the new year fresh. And that uh, also in Hebrew is Yom Kippur. I know people pronounce it in various sloppier ways than that, Yom Kippur and Yom Kippur, and, but it's Yom Kippur and it's a day of atonement. And it says in the text, you shall afflict yourself that day. And uh, just from those words, you can't really tell what that means. I mean, I would have guessed if I only saw those words, it meant that they used to whip themselves uh, on that day. I, I have no idea if that's true or not, if anybody did that. But it was later interpreted in post-biblical times to mean fasting, that you don't uh, eat for 24 hours. And because it's Judaism and you don't want to slip and miss, they make it 25 hours. Thou shalt not add and thou shalt not take away. They, they make it 25 hours. Why Jews? You know, and, and that last hour is the hardest, let me tell you. It's uh, especially doing with, if you're used to drinking coffee every day, you get such a caffeine headache during those last few hours. Um, so uh, I used to get terrible headaches on the Day of Atonement because I, I, I would fast on, and, until somebody said, no, you have to sort of wean yourself off caffeine. You start drinking decaf the last few days before Yom Kippur and then you'll be all right. And sure enough, and I was, I was fine, so I, I may have saved, you know, if you're a Jewish and you're going to do it this year, now you know. Um, but uh, only Leviticus adds those extra two holidays. The book of Deuteronomy does not seem to know about those two holidays. Why? That's lecture 24. 19, that's lecture 19. Deuteronomy has this famous passage, it says, justice, justice you shall pursue. Why does it say justice, justice twice? Yeah, it's the Bible, so everybody needs a reason for everything. You can't just go just because. You're not allowed just because. And uh, so some have interpreted to mean you have to pursue justice, but in a just way. So like you can't cheat to make somebody who deserves a punishment get it. You know, a judge can't make a false decision even though he knows the guy is really guilty but it hasn't been, you, you can't do any of that. But that, and that's a lovely interpretation, but that's, that's not likely what it is. What it probably is, is uh, has to do with the nature, again, of, of uh, just mechanics of ancient writing. If you want to emphasize something when you're writing, what mechanisms do you have? Underlining, italics, bold face and exclamation points. Four ways of making emphasis that we have, which, which is pretty good. In biblical Hebrew script, if you look at a manuscript of the, the Bible, none of the above. They hadn't yet invented underlining italics, bold face, or exclamation points. So you had to find ways in the words to emphasize something. And there are various mechanisms in Hebrew grammar to do that. And if you take a course in Biblical Hebrew, you'll learn these things they do to do emphasis. And one of them is you repeat a word. So I suspect that that's all the repetition is about. So in a way that, that's kind of a banal kind of answer, but my great teacher, Professor Cross, used to say the most banal answer is usually the correct one. And it's, but it, it, just, it, it just makes sense. But that's also a very powerful thing, that if you really want to let people know, not only should you have justice, you should pursue justice. And they really want to, but, and they want to go, pursue justice, exclamation, oh yeah, we don't have those yet. So, you know, justice, justice, and you repeat the word. And there are a few other passages like that in the Bible where word is repeated and, and, a, and a repetition is, is what you could do when you really wanted to make a point when you didn't have all these mechanisms that we have. So, pursue justice, justice, and we will see you next time.